Hi, everyone. Welcome to Scouting for Growth. Today, I'm meeting with Henri Winan, co-founder and CEO of Akinova, an electronic marketplace built to ease the transfer and trading of insurance and insurance risks. During our conversation, Henri and I discussed the importance of strong taxonomy when we move into multi-party electronic placements. We talked about tangible and tangible assets. We talked about transition risk, cyber risk, and NFTs. We also talked about driving liquidity in the liquid markets. Henri also shared during our talk that intangible assets and uncertain marketplaces bring new opportunities for risk transfer and risk sharing mechanism to facilitate more liquidity into those markets and asset classes that need it most. So let's get started. So, Henri, thank you so much to be with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. And, you know, the, the usual question I ask when I start the, the podcast is, who are you, Henri? Where you come from and what got you into insurance? Well, that's a great question. Um, who am I? I'm a Belgian uh, who happens to be living in the UK, married to an English rose. Um and passionate about looking at new opportunities where you can do something better than what's existing. And better can be, I mean, that's what our entrepreneur means, right, in French. Uh, so the, the whole objective is to actually see uh, some, uh, a large market, which is, which is there already, uh, where uh, clients or anybody in the value chain in some way uh, feels that we could do a better job. And uh, so I've done that in the world of energy, uh, in the world of transportation. And uh, so who am I? I'm an engineer who likes to solve problems. And uh, more to the point, I really love to build teams which can help to solve the problem because on your own, you can only go so far, right? Uh, and that's really the exciting thing is to actually develop a team go through all the storming, norming, et cetera, to a place where you can really get um, the best of everybody on the crew. So that nobody leaves, you know, the kind of the, the uh, virtual brain rack at the front of the, the office. When you come up, you, you have fantastic bunch of, of different things that you know how to do. And when you arrive in the office, it's written, I'm the CEO or the CFO or the senior product uh, director. Uh, so you bring everything and uh and then really defining the target and making sure that we get there uh and also that we learn all the way through uh, but also have a bit of fun that's superb so before i go into your founder's journey and uh, the fact that you know any founder go through their ups and downs i would love to talk to you about something i read on your linkedin profile you have dozens of patents granted and pending can you Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, look, when you think of a business, um, many years ago, someone told me it's a bit like playing on, the, on a piano. Now, I couldn't play on a piano to save my life, but I do get the point. If you only have one note and you just play that one note the whole day long, which is cash, 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 or you know, commercial, 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 you, you, you miss the point is that you need to be able to play all the keyboard. Uh, and one of the keys on the keyboard is tangible intellectual property. And so if you think you have an idea, and an idea is a cost until you make money out of it, right? And then it becomes a profit center. Um, so if you have an idea that you think will have a commercial value, then I think it's the right thing for your business to create some tangible intellectual property. And so if the leadership or the boss is basically creating some tangible IP, it basically creates that mental framework for the team to do so. So I've done that in the past um, in uh, logistics of, air, uh, of passengers in airports, um, of hydrogen systems, uh, of uh, micro trading using distributed ledger uh, between physical assets. So if you have a solar panel in your solar panel next door, how do you get credited to actually send some electrons to your neighbors? Um, and 
so you need to have a commercial element, otherwise it's just a cost. Um, so yes, that's that's how you have the patents, and then you understand the tangible value of that, which has value to the investors. It of course has value to you because you have 20 years once it's granted for you to you know make money out of it, uh, and it becomes a bit more exciting. So I guess you know when you look at those patents, are you going to use them? For yourself, because you're already running an amazing company called Akinova. Are you going to sell them? How are you going to monetize them? What's your magical plan? So look, for for each time, what I want to make sure is that the intellectual property is associated with the business. So those patents are basically, yes, I went through the whole process, I had the idea, sometimes in with a crew of other people, right? So ideas don't usually uh, happen just in a vacuum. Usually there are some other people. So sometimes we have several of us listed. So all of the historical patterns are typically with the business that uh, you then assign the intellectual property to. And that's the right thing because at the time I was employed by that business and it makes sense for them to own the fruits of the investment into me at the time uh, to get that. Now, patents and intellectual property going forwards, clearly then it's attached to uh, Akinova. And the, the 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 challenge for particularly for fintechs and insurtechs is sometimes you can't patent the thing because it's a business idea, and so actually being able to then keep a trade secret maybe with some uh, some patents around it, which we're exploring big time on a few of our concepts, um, is a way to of course not signal to everybody what you're doing, which is once you you know, file something, you tell people, hey, this is something I'm working on. Um, but equally, so you keep the trade secret, which is that kind of component. Uh, but equally, there are some pieces that I believe, and patent attorney believe also, that we could patent, which is quite important because it gives you an ability to have a, a discourse with very large organizations. Uh, which is not about being, you know, the the old uh, uh, stick licensing where you go and hit someone on the head saying, hey, I've got this IP, you're infringing me, pay me some money. That's not the point. The point is that you arrive with an asset that can be valued. And there are some great tech, uh, you know, technologies being developed out there to be able to value those, which then allow you to have a value-based conversation with your partners. And by bringing this thing here, by prosecuting in this way, the NPV of it, of it is worth X. And so when you have that conversation with a large organization on the other side, you come with a chunk of value already, and then you can negotiate a better deal. Yeah, interesting. So when you look at your journey, you have been working for big technology companies in the UK. You have actually set up a lot of patents and uh, you are actually extracting value uh, from those, some of those, and you intend to extract value uh, from uh, new ones you are setting up in the future. So when you look at your founder's journey, Henri, what has been your biggest achievement and your high highs? And can you share with us some of your lows? Sure. The, the, the biggest highs have been when someone has been amazing that either I brought in or someone else in the crew brought in and uh, either people wrote them off and said, well, I'm never going to go anywhere. I'm five years away from retirement. Um, and, and actually uh, finding that they are the best supporters for the new ideas. So they, they were essentially against the new stuff and suddenly they flip to actually being for it. And because they have the experience, they are able to go a lot faster to change things. The most exciting things are, so for instance, when I was uh, many years ago for a large uh, engine manufacturer, um, it was a transformation program. So there's introduction of SAP, enterprise risk planning, uh, and I had a budget. I had nobody reporting to me in that kind of, you know, gravity organization thing, but I had been given resources by different resource groups within the, the firm. And the best uh, bosses of these areas handing me over resources or people to go and to go and do the change program were the, um, they gave me the best people that they had. And sometimes they thought they were giving me the people that they didn't really want to have on their team. So why don't you go and do some change program there on the side and an implementation? 
which is pretty important for the business, right? I mean, you uh, when you do enterprise risk planning, you change everything in the business and you reclose the thing and you start the engine and hope that everything works. Um, and actually, those people were the best people because it wasn't just a bright person, but it was a person who was bright, but not using the brain to actually, I can do it if. They were spending their time or I can't do it because. And once you've changed from that, I can't do it because to I can do it if, amazing. So people who had a whole career understood everything inside the business. They were about three, four years away from one of whom was uh, three, four years away from uh, retirement. Of course, they knew everything and who in particular to make stuff happen. And then the other one uh, was a lady who was engineering. So there was um, you know, inappropriate behavior, if I can put it like this. So she'd been parked with me and she became fantastic. And from uh, last time I looked at her profile a few years ago, she was heading a big division. And uh, that's my best time when you, you know, you can see that you punch the line site, you, you, um, and they've done it on their own, but you, you were just happening to be there at the right time. Best time in my, uh, in my career. The worst time, um, when you know that, um, uh, something is right, but the events, so the external events basically conspire to making it really difficult for you to, uh, to prevail. Um, so, you know, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, soon after an IPO, suddenly I, I have a family tragedy, uh, which made life incredibly difficult in, in all sorts of dimensions. Uh, and it's, it becomes a very personal journey on the flip side. What it basically underlined is timing, but also time is everything. You know, we're all talking about money, meetings, etc. The only commodity that we have as human beings is time. So invest it wisely. Time. It's great to be with you here today, Sabine. Uh -huh. Thank you, Henri. And you know, that is what I often said to my team: is we don't have, you know, hand less time. And so. Today in the world we're in, which is highly digitized, and we're probably doing twice as much as we were doing three or four years ago, we have to select our project and our time very carefully, 100%. And your stories are interesting because what you are saying is also, you know, we have all, all of us have talent and we just need to reduce uh, our resources in the right way. And often when we work for big companies, we do not always have the luxury to use our resources in the right way. But I think a lot of companies are doing better and better to actually identify, you know, the creative from the, uh, the thinker and the analytical uh, mindset and being more cognizant that actually everybody has talents. And if we can use people in the right way, we are more likely to retain them. Probably where in the UK, talent acquisition is so hard today. Well, it's uh, it's going to be interesting for the next six to nine months, right, so as to what the economy is going to do and whether or not that will change. I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case, um, that things won't change for the worse in terms of the economy, but I think that's baked in. So then the question is, how do we as an industry attract the right talent? And and our industry has to be exciting, right? So you asked me how they are getting to uh, insurance. It's by accident. Yeah. I mean, I knew about insurance because I was a client of it. Uh, but it's the thing that you you think after you've gone home type of thing, right? And uh, usually ask people, when was the last time you woke up in the morning thinking, woo, I need to buy some insurance. <laughs> uh, and usually the answer is a lot of people wake up uh, thinking that unless they have to, right? Unless you're going somewhere or you, you your business needs it or something like this. So it's what do we need to change to be part of that journey? Yeah. And what do we need to, to have that? And so I, I just met my co-founder Jean-Michel through my brother actually we were invited for an event in London I was early so I went there um, Jean-Marc and, and Jean-Michel are both directors in the same business so it's a fund and Jean-Marc looks after so my brother looks after specific strategies and Jean-Michel some others and then uh, he said Henri uh, you must be an entrepreneur because you've done it a few times now uh, so why don't we just do something together I've got a great idea for you uh, and then that was the that was basically the the start of it, and we decided to co-found the business uh, once I've done my due diligence, um, and uh, I haven't looked back uh, ever since. 
You know, well, tell us a little bit more about Akinova. And I remember when I met you, I think it was six or seven years ago, right? We were talking about acceleration and all the things. And then I might have met you, so well, you don't need an accelerator. You definitely do not, don't need me. <laughs> Well, you, you do need the help, all the help you can get when you build some stuff new. Look, by definition, I mean, you have a look at it in a room, right? So when you're in a big room and you come up with a new idea, the people who look the cleverest are the people who question the idea and say, well, but yes, but 10 years ago it didn't work or this and that, etc. So if you want to look clever in a group, don't come with an idea, come, come with critiques of an idea, right? So. When you start your business, that's how it goes. Whether it's an investor, whether it's your client, whether it's someone who is an advisor or whomever. Uh, so you'll have a lot of that. So you need to have a sense of what, what are we here for? What are we trying to do? So if you break down insurance, you've got someone with a risk and they're trying to reduce that risk. So first they need to know that they've got a risk because sometimes you have a risk, but you don't know it. So first you need to be told you've got a risk and understand what the value of that risk is. If I think about commercial insurance, right, which is one of our big, uh, big points. So the, the, that's the first thing. Do I know I have a risk and what's it worth? So I need to have people who are, and that's usually people, technology might tell you ping, it's time to do something, or have you looked at your bank accounts, you know, something needs to be done, or, uh something major happened in the world and you should think of something but usually someone will have then to convert that let's call it business requirement into something that the capital that is used to underwriting that will understand it and that's typically a broker right then of course you'll have some lawyers some service providers if you're in cyberspace uh, you know uh, forensics accountants forensics uh, you know, people who check that uh, your system uh, that was indeed compromised in the way it was. Um, and then, of course, you have the investors. Now, the investor can be an underwriter, traditional capital, so insurance or reinsurance. But they can also be just a family office or, you know, a, a, an investor saying, well, actually, it's a good risk. I'd like to underwrite it. So if, if you break it down back to the, the basic components, I've got to be able to make it simpler for the person who's got a problem to understand that they've got one and to be able to articulate it. On the other side, I need to be able to say, well, what's it's worth, min, max, and most likely. And if it's min, min, you know, if it goes badly, how bad can it go? And if it goes well, but usually, you know, where's the middle? And that's an exercise in business dictionary because I've got uh, whether it's a be a broker, an insurer, a reinsurer, an insurance link securities, or a normal investor or across, across all our chain, they all have a quite a different business dictionary. So if I'm a production bro broker versus a placement broker versus an insurance or reinsurance broker versus an eyeless broker, I, I use different words. And sometimes it's not even different words, which is even worse. Uh, they're actually the same word, but they mean something different. And it brings me back to when I was on the uh, board of a joint venture in Japan, we had pre-board meetings where things were discussed as to what was gonna happen at the board meeting, just to make sure that everybody understood uh, language-wise. Then the board meeting was happening and quite often afterwards, we would have a meeting where we explained what we thought we'd understood that the other person was telling us. Now it might sound cumbersome, but you never come out, came out of a meeting not being clear as to what people were saying. Very often in insurance, we say something, we hear something from the client, we convert it using a word into our own business dictionary, and then there's basically uh, a, a loss of information. And if you think about the information from the risk owner, so the person who wants to be insured, the insured, all the way to the capital, there are lots of translations. So the loss of information is immense from the front to the back. So Akinova is, is really there to think about the edges and then build the technology and the processes from the edges um, versus focusing entirely on one or two things within the chain. Because then you are always focused on who is there to make sure that the, the risk transfer works. Yeah. And for risk transfer to work, you need premium and you need capital and you need people to be able to explain what, what, what is it. As long as we can satisfy that, that community, we're doing our job. And then you can introduce liquidity because the more liquid an asset is, there is no market for risk of any depth. 
it's it's once a year you have premium coming in maybe there's a tiny amount of secondaries maybe some equities are within the listed uh, insurers but there's not a lot of liquidity and for more capital to come to the industry you need liquidity because people need to be able to say you know if things don't pan out and it's now worth 80 cents in the dollar who can i send it to mm -hmm. And if you can't sell it to anyone, then the liquidity is shrinking immensely. You only talk to people who will just understand it better than everybody else. And, and the market needs more capital. So what I hear is when you look at your community, you're actually serving different stakeholders. Even within the broker community, which is commercial, you address the need of a multitude of macro segments within the broker um, environment and then enable them to place risk with uh, carrier, with whoever is providing transfer risk within your environment, which I assume can be insurers, carriers, lots of London um, uh, syndicates, but there could be many other uh, outside capacity providers. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Henri? Yeah. To totally. So we've got a database now, probably about 21,000 global investors. Of, of that uh, database, about 5% is insurance, traditional insurance capital. Uh, and the rest of it is, you know, whomever. Now, the challenge, of course, is you can't just say that, let's say I want to get some climate related, some transition related race. So that's one of our uh, four pillars. And you, you can't go and sell that to someone who is only interested in a property in the middle of France or, or in the middle of the US. Um, they'll only be interested in what they really like to see and what they really understand. So there's an immense amount of work where uh, we always talk about AI and machine learning, et cetera. But I think a little bit of HI, human intelligence, is not bad, uh, which then allows to basically shrink the universe and then get more the tech to basically uh, work on that and distribution and the like and, and make it easier for the brokers and the risk uh, the risk manager or the CFO of the business that want to, to get insured to find the right capital to, to underwrite the risk. So you already mentioned trans, tra, um, you know, transition risk, which is uh, one of the major risks the Bank of England have asked a lot of you know, financial service providers to uh, look at uh, in, in recent years, uh, which is really about looking at the change in business model. I, I mean, I, I, I tend to talk about uh, transition risk as a business model which is being transitioned from one to another. An example would be an uh, energy provider, let's think about BP, Total, who have to move from fossil fuel to uh, providing renewable energy. So moving to solar and all this great new uh, tech, am I right? And so what you are providing to them is uh, a way to offload that risk uh, and uh, enable them to make sure that they can, I guess, ensure the new project, but then the old project, am I right? Yeah, I think, as, so you're spot on. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of depth in that. And, uh, and so we're not going to go in there, otherwise we'll be here for two hours. A very exciting conversation, but maybe not for everyone. <laughs> um, so let's start from uh, the, the business model transition is, and the capital intensity transition that people have in their business is, is immense. Um, also, there's a huge amount of, you know, a lot of people worry about transitional risk and ESG and all of that. But, I, you know, cyber risk is a big ingredient in that, which is part of intangibles, which is a second one of our pillars. Um, to be able to, to do that transfer, I would love for the, the businesses and for the insurance industry to move from talking about risk transfer to risk sharing. Because if you think, uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, uh, so in cyber risk, but it's no different to if you're monitoring uh, a well or if you're monitoring a factory or, if, you know, to dynamically be able to understand how your business is performing, particularly as you transfer, you're transitioning from A to B. That's, you know, it's the transition is the risk, right? Um, if I underwrite a risk and I'm capital underwriting, whether I'm an insurer, insurer, or you know, uh, a big uh, PE firm that takes a position, I want to really understand how that transition is going. 
Right? It's no different than when you go to a bank and you take a loan. You'll probably have someone to oversee, uh, you know, once a quarter, once a month, uh, or once every week, depending on how your cash flow is doing, how you do it to manage the transition. So when you say transferring, there's a bit like kind of a here's a, here's a pass. And sometimes it's hospital pass, you as an underwriter, you lose money. And sometimes it's a great pass and you as an underwriter, you make money. Well, if you do risk sharing in the cyber world would mean that now I have as a business to give you a check on the pulse of what I'm doing. It's a bit like, you know, I have uh, one of these watches on, uh, on my business wrist and it tells you whether the pulse is going well or suddenly panic is setting and you should be thinking, OK, what should I think about it? So it's, it's that risk from risk transfer to risk sharing. The more the industry talks about risk sharing, because the reality is once I've underwritten you, I'm joined at the hip with you for the duration of that risk. And so the more there's a, a passage of information, the more you can basically get more capacity to underwrite the things that the businesses really want to do. There are some businesses which need to transition in a dimension of more cyber risk because now I'm more and more distributed, but also have massive amount of transition risk of carbon footprint and you know I need cash to finance this thing over there. So there are immense transition risk which needs to be managed and the investors need to understand what they are being exposed to, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, yeah. Sorry. So uh, look, yeah. it's exciting. I mean, that's all I'm trying to say is, look, when you are an insure tech or a fintech, if it's business as usual, it's very difficult to come in unless your stuff is 10x better, you know, the, the dimension of 10x on cost, on speed to market, etc. Um, when you have dislocations in the market, and there are dislocations on transitions that the clients see now uh, from the commercial end, then by definition, there will be a dislocation in the, in, in the capital that underwrites them. Yeah. Now that's the best time to basically go and launch things which make that capital understanding and the business dictionary to be easier. That's where we are. And one thing I like you actually highlighted is not anymore just about transfer risk. It's about risk sharing. And I think it, it, I mean, I could see in my head, you know, when you start looking at the startup ecosystem, young ventures, um, it's not anymore around this vendor. Um, you know, supplier, seller, you know, relationship where you have a vendor relationship anymore. You have to be part of a partnership collaboration where you actually have to drive some trust through transparency and by providing the information people need to actually make the right decision. And I think with your concept of risk sharing, you actually also entail trust and transparency and also by using technology, I assume as well, enable the older parties to know what they are doing and where they are going together. With a common business dictionary, with no loss of information. And, and we know it works, that transition, because there's always the concern of if I have some info and you don't have some info, I could price better, and, you know, et cetera. Um, that's okay for a community. Um, but if, if I now look at my transition risk, and if I look at, um, you know, whether it's B Marsh, Aon, Gallagher's and so forth, and you look at the world of intangibles, which is the undiscovered country for all of us as a, as a market, um, the last 30, 35, maybe even more than that years now have been really about the significance of the importance of the industry, insurance as a whole, to the world GDP has decreased yeah. you know, steadily. Right? And that's because we are much better to understand and be able to apportion value to something that's physical. You can touch it, you can say, well, how much was it trade for? Well, that's the price. Uh, when it's intangible, of course, you know, we talked about IP and patents earlier. earlier. How, do you, how do you take a view, right? So, so then the question is, what's the business dictionary around these intangibles? What's the way that you can basically say from A to B, this is how we should think of value? what's the realizable value and then it's about the risk transfer uh, and then moving that to a risk sharing arrangement and that means that i have a better understanding of where you are and how you evolve that transition going back to the transition risk and also we've agreed a business dictionary as to what we are actually measuring otherwise we you know are i'm measuring something but what does it mean right mm -hmm. and and that's 
that's a deeply human behavior because what we then have to do before we go and build tech sometimes as an entrepreneur you rush in you say i know exactly what it looks like Boom. here we are here's some technology put it in front of the clients client says uh, it looks great <laughs> i'll see you later right so then the question is how do you get from there to actually talking about money and that's really about discovering the real pain point you know where's the real migraine here's an aspirin oh look you can you, you now feel better here's some vitamins yeah. and that's business right? that's what we have to do so building things which don't scale up there was a talk i can't remember from whom from somewhere saying that do the things which don't scale up first but know how you're going to get to scale it up Absolutely. Don't scale up means that you have to do the things by hand. It might look electronic on the surface, but you do it by hand. You therefore understand out what are all the hospital passes and the good passes and the things which don't go anywhere. And from there, you can then build your system and you can basically get the right take. Yeah, so you start as a wizard of hose, right? Which is a technique often we, we can use as startups to actually do the things manually and see where the process goes and then you actually apply technology. And another thing you were saying, Henri, which is really starting with taxonomy, right? Start with really understanding the language uh, you are going to commercialize so that everybody understand what we are talking about, which I think is very, very strong and very powerful. The other point I captured, which I remember, you know, reading in the news is um, one of the first deals you actually traded on the Akinova platform was cybersecurity. And I remember that was a few years ago. And so being able to go into intangible asset is actually fascinating because that's a question I often get from insurer, how we move from physical to, to intangible, uh, which takes me, can you actually insure the metaverse and NFTs as a result? Uh, totally. I mean, there's no debate about it, right? Uh, but you need to have... Uh, for me, business is a bit like uh, jumping from one tree to the next tree to the next tree, you know, with a kind of rope. So you need to get the right length of the rope to, to the tree, and then you need to find the next tree, and then you can start again, right? So if you, if you have that mental picture. So th the question is, if you go straight to something that is completely intangible, and you don't have a business dictionary, so a taxonomy, right? So you and I, when we say something, we mean the same thing. Um, and in particular, because at some point you need to be able to say, what's the value at risk? How much money is this worth? Because that's the discourse it needs to be in a contract. I'll insure you for X. Um, but there's a journey to get there. And I'll start from the world of if you have, for instance, if you're a bank today. So uh, there are a couple of uh, there are a few new banks as uh, banks in the UK uh, launching one of whom I know one of the uh, the co-founders uh, Bank North. So it just launched. Uh, it, it, they are basically for SME, the north of England. Um, when you see them on the right, or you hear about what they do to underwrite a client and to basically have a loan, I mean you underwrite a business. You don't underwrite a specific thing. You basically say, here's a loan to do uh, specific things, but actually you underwrite the team and the business ability to repay it. And you hope as a bank that you're going to have your principal back and and that's the bargain basement, right? So you have your money back and then you hope you can get the interest on top. But essentially they underwrite you as a business. They don't underwrite you as, you know, a fleet of vehicles or, you know, whatever it might be. So once you understand that, if you can underwrite the business and not just the class, you have a much better way of understanding the intangible value around the business. So we actually trademark that uh, on the right, the client and not the class. And to get there, you need to also get the capital to understand what that means. So our view has been, if you start with um, the transition risk more in climate, climate related. Why? Because capital has been very proximate to the risk through insurance link securities. That's where it started. And then you get to places that people understand already. Uh, mortgage is a great place to be because actually if you unpack mortgage reinsurance, one part of it is uh, climate. You might think of it, but actually it's climate. So back to pillar one, transition climate. Uh, but the other one is credit. And guess what? If I'm an investor in capital market, I'll get credit risk the whole day long. So it's appealing to a broader universe now. So that's step two. Step three, 
how to get credit insurance because that's what you do the whole day on a capital market. So now it's step three, which is expanding the universe of people who can then look at the, the type of deals. What we then have to do is to prepare policies, which we are trying now with uh, uh, soon, a um, few weeks from now, hopefully with the Fortune 100, uh, but before that, 40 to 50 type mid, mid, mid market companies, which is to underwrite the company as a whole. And with that, I'm preparing for my fourth pillar, which is the intangibles. And there you need to be able to have the right structure to deliver the right value to the risk manager, but that can be understood by the capital that underwrites it, traditional capital and alternative capital. And if you do these three things, these four things in the right order, then each time you start from a place where the business dictionary is already established. So you don't need to teach anyone because that takes a long time. But each time you increase the depth of the capital available to you a little bit yeah. until it becomes much more meaningful. That's our plan. Which is which fascinates me because, as you said, often when we think about insurance, it's about insuring classes, uh, mm -hmm. real estate, you know, I guess cyber would be considered as as a class or maybe the creator economy, maybe in the future, which is the new things on the block. But what you are saying now is you need to look at the business in, in terms of many different ingredients. And one thing which has always fascinated me is the brand value. You know, there, there is a survey which is done every year where you can actually see which company are the highest intangible asset from brand. And, mm -hmm. and that is an asset, which often is not always really well understood, partly from the insurance viewpoint, I think. Um, and what you are saying to me is we have reinvented the way we look at um, insurance or risk transfer or risk sharing when we actually are able to look at the full business and each of the ingredients, including the people, the values they are going to create for their uh, customers, and then the asset class they are focusing on to actually provide much more ability to find capital and to find a way to secure the business for the long term, which is far more sophisticated so and complex than a lot of things we hear out there. It, it is, but the reason why we organize by class is because we as when when you put your hat on, let's say as an actuary, which I'm not, I mean, there are super clever people um, and they work super hard to understand a particular risk to a, a place where statistically there's more chance for the capital to underwrite it to make money than not, right? And for that, you, you end up by being a specialist of automotive in a particular segment, commercial consumers, whatever it might be in a particular geography, because there are particular risks, you know, about hail or whatever it might be, flooding. Um, and, and you have to then specialize. Now, if you think about my, my uh, reference to a bank on the writing, right? So I'm underwriting you now. I don't want to write, uh, you know, your cars or whatever. I'm lending your business some money. You've got the, the money up front. It's not like insurance where you may have money if you claim, right? Uh, you have the money up front. Um, so there is a way to think about it is that insurance is contingent capital. That's all it is. You know, whether it's banking capital and you have a facility or it's insurance and you have basically a contractual facility, it's contingent capital. If you start from that, then you try to say, you, on, you can understand that the dichotomy is, if I'm doing insurance, the reason why we've organized ourselves by class is because there's no liquidity or very little liquidity. I buy something and the cash is on the balance sheet for a year, or if it's UBI, maybe much shorter. But basically, you try to accrue some capital. Um, some of it will go in reserving, you know, some of it you'll be able to reinvest, etc. But essentially, it's because... I really have to understand that one thing super well to be able to say whether or not it's priced accordingly or not. And then I can try to you know, get the client to pay the, the price that I think it's worth. Um, capital markets has gone the other route, which is to say the more liquidity I have, it may not be priced correctly, but the price will be discovered by the market. And for that, you need a bit of secondary trading, right? So the journey that we're embarking on is to say that, of course, there will still be uh, a home to be able to be the super person to on the right particular property in Austin, Texas, or whatever it might be. Of course, uh, that won't change. But to go to the next place, which is where the industry can increase, not just by two, 3%, but 
be 10x larger. You have to think of the way you underwrite the, uh, the, uh, the risk in a different way. And you have to get back to insurance is contingent capital. Once you do that and you have liquidity, so if something happens, so let's say I buy a bond. So there are some technology firms, they'll sell you a bond for 30 years. In the technology space where you, you, where you might have been the queen of the, the hill yesterday and tomorrow you basically toast, but they sell you a bond for 30 years. The reason people buy it is because it will give them a yield you know, annually or quarterly. But also if things were to pan out, not pan out or pan out, they could load more if things are getting very exciting or they could offload it. So that liquidity offsets the need for the actuary to understand everything. Because when you buy a bond, you don't understand everything about the business, yet you bought it. And the reason why you're happy to buy it is because A, you hope to get a return from it, and B, if things don't pan out or things pan out, I could actually load more or I could basically unload and basically reduce my exposure. And once you understand that, that, that contingent capital plus the liquidity, it means that I now not, don't need to know all there is to know about oh, his glasses uh, uh, that he loses the whole day long. This is why I'm not wearing them. Um, because it's, it's super transparent, so it's the bane of my life. But you know, you don't need to know all about that risk. You now need to know me as a person. Does that make me a high risk because I'm driving without my glasses, which of course I wouldn't do? Um, but or does it matter? Yeah. Now you can get into the intangible world. Mm -hmm. And when people start to understand that, then we won't try to basically monitor everything. You know, what's your risk on cyber this and that and the other? Ultimately, the response to of management within the first hour having been breached, for instance, if you are a listed business, makes the difference between you your stock going up, up, yeah. or down, and then uh, six months later finding that the volatility on your stock is higher, so your cost of capital has gone up, whether you like it or not, even if your stock has gone back up, which it often does, and, and those responses needs to be captured in the way you lend. We contingent capital. That's if true. you boil it back down to that, you understand that both worlds are, are still there. So when you look at all this, you've talked to us and future opportunity within our industry, looking at a future tech world, what would be the couple of things you said that we need to watch very closely and where there would be immense opportunity for our industry in the future? Commercial insurance, uh, A, it's profitable. Uh, be the degree of pain from the, the biggest risk managers and CFOs because they would like to have a, a discourse with the industry for things that they would like to do, like all these transition risks. So do I need to basically capitalize myself even more captive? And um, so there's a capital inefficiency there, but nonetheless, there's tax efficiencies and a whole bunch of things which could be useful. But then the more that happens, the less the fewer the good risks come up to the industry to feed the industry, which then to get the capital. So it can be a vicious circle. So I think if we look at commercial insurance, and if you look at the commercial insurance for things which are not, and, and we, we have two ears, right? So I'm wearing one of these things. I was told many years ago, oh, you, you're born with two ears and one mouth. Use it accordingly. So we, the industry, need to listen with two ears, not hear the client and say, yeah, yeah, I'll come back, uh, but the price is now twice as much. We need to actively listen to our clients. And then we need to be able to articulate in the right business dictionary what we think we can do for them and the path that we'll need to get from them. If you look at cyber insurance, four or five years ago, you couldn't get any information from the clients. Once a year, you fill in the form, that was it. You know, it's like life insurance. And on, on Monday, I'll tell you that everything. I don't run, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I do run, I don't smoke, I don't drink. And then on Tuesday, I do exactly the opposite. Well, to do that risk sharing, now I'm going to have to share with you some information. And it will be continuous, not just once a year. With that, you can start to be able to do a whole load more stuff. Capital markets does that the whole day long. Doesn't get it always right, of course, but there's always a price. So looking at uh, this going to be my last question for you, Henri, what would be your three top tip for anybody out there, risk managers or entrepreneurs wanting to come into our industry? 
the first thing it's a it's a highly social industry and no digital marketplace like any of otherwise is going to change that so if you want to have an industry where we play our cards right as an industry it can be 10x the size of what it is at least there are very few industries that i can think of which are a fundamentally important there is no advanced economy without insurance industry whether people like it or not that's the, that's the case yeah you want to run a business you want to drive a car you want to own some assets you you'll have to have some insurance somewhere so if you want an industry that's systemically important and fundamentally important to economies if you want an industry where there's a social fabric and if you want an industry where technology has yet to make its mark and i don't mean it in a bad way because we always forget that in the 70s insurance were the first ones to buy the big computers to be able to crunch numbers right um so if we can rekindle that um love for applied technology not just tech for the sake of it and applied not just to improve ourselves within the insurance industry so i can transfer more information faster to you that's all good but applied to be able to with two ears listen to the clients so the risk manager and on their side the capital that underwrites it and reconstruct not in a big bang usually that you know you know what happens to big bangs so big and bang and then god knows what afterwards if you can reconstruct it in a way that is more concentric with the client not at the edge or at one end but in the middle and the capital also in the middle and then the people with the business dictionary brokers and so forth around it that's what we need to do and if you are a graduate and if you want to apply your numerate skills or your uh negotiation skills so you don't need to just know everything about numbers it's useful though um and if you have a, a string of i want to apply technology not just tech for the sake of it uh this is the industry for you because it's important and everybody uses it so Henri, where can we find you if we want to know a bit more about akinova or yourself where do we go so uh several ways of course there's www.akinova.com that's the online version uh, we are at 15 bishops gate in central london uh, we have employees in spain uh in in uh in the us uh i mean so we are a bit everywhere uh but uh the 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 website is the best and there's also a telephone number in there which basically helps people to go direct to us me or others in the, in the business then of course there's my email address uh we know at akinova.com there you have it merci well i want to thank so much henri for the great conversation and great insight you've shared with us today i think we've learned a lot around tangible intangible asset taxonomies and business model reinvention great tip for the risk manager of tomorrow so thank you ben merci on va le faire en français maintenant bien sûr jusqu'à la prochaine fois Au revoir. Au revoir, merci. Merci. <laughs>